Hello there ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your Gaming Monk for the evening. In the time since I started this review series, there are certain motifs that I will admit to have fallen into. One of them is best described with the adage, the best D&D is being made outside of D&D. While this could apply to the third party expansions created as a result of the open gaming license, that's not specifically where I'm aiming that adage. D&D has been a victim of its own traditions for years, as I've said before, and will continue to say. There are many mechanics that have been used for their own sake rather than for effectiveness. This is why the non-official experiences are so fascinating, because they don't suffer from this demand for tradition and can approach it the way they want to. Enter Legend System, not to be confused with the RuneQuest and all but name thing that Mongoose made some years ago. Originally, this was born out of a contest on the Giants in the Playground forums to modify 3rd edition, but it has since spiraled into its own beast. As a result, this is going to be a game that will appear familiar in some ways, and vastly different in others. But how does it hold up? Does it establish itself apart from D&D's trappings? Let's find out. In its previous similar entries, I've opted with doing a single class approach, mostly based around a certain archetype. In the case of our character for Legend, Gino, that will not be the case as we'll be using a bit of a monk-barbarian hybrid. First step is race which in our case will be human, granting us the human benefits to ability scores, a skill, and a feat. Second is class. While we'll be going with monk for class specifically, which normally grants us the discipline of the serpent, crane, and dragon as its fast, slow, and medium tracks, I'll get to that later, we'll be replacing the lattermost with the barbarian's path of war track, specifically its dervish version. Monks have two good saves and one poor save. So we'll go with Reflex and Fortitude for good progression, and Will for poor progression. Third is Ability Scores. While it can be assigned, we'll be rolling again, this time rolling 5d6 and dropping the lowest two. After rolling the scores, we land on Strength 16, Dexterity 18, Constitution 16, Intelligence 14, Wisdom 13, and Charisma 11. Well, this would normally result in low attacks because Monks have Wisdom as their offensive modifier, and Constitution as their defensive, Having the Dervish track changes the former to Dexterity. In addition, being human grants us a plus 2 bonus to 1 ability score, which we'll put into Dexterity to make it 20. Fourth is Skills. Our choice in class grants us a number of trained skills, which receive a bonus equal to our level. Since we went with Monk, we have 6 skills to be trained in, so we'll go with Acrobatics, Athletics, Vigor, Geography, Diplomacy, and Perception. Fifth step is Feats. Now all starting characters begin with one feat, but as a human we get a second one. We'll go with Reaver and to Iron Married in this case. Lastly, we begin with one lesser magic item, which will go with the Cloak of the Endless Journey. Character creation in Legend is mostly familiar if you've played a D20 based game before. The only real issue I have is that it's not entirely self-contained within the creation chapter. I'm not a fan of page jumping during character creation, and I prefer minimizing it as best I can. Minor nitpicks aside, the game's depth of choice is inspired. Since the classes are not nearly set in stone due to Legend's track system outright encouraging multi-classing, since all it takes to do multi-classing is just swapping one track. There are even tracks independent of classes to add further options. If you have a more traditional mindset, you'll probably have some adaptation issues due to the lack of certain familiar classes like the fighter. While it is possible to make the traditional archetype by multi-classing the Barbarian, this might be a sticking point for some. As I mentioned at the start, Legend began as a modified version of D&D 3rd Edition, and as such the core mechanic will be familiar to those who have played it. It has the same collection of actions that D20 does, albeit ones where options like Power Attack come standard instead of taking up a feat slot. Class-wise, each class has three tracks, a fast track, a slow track, and a medium track, which determines what features you learn faster or slower. At creation, you may swap out one of your class's default tracks for a track from another class like we did, or from one of the independent tracks, with some exception. If that's not enough, you can do this again with the guild initiation feat. Or, if that isn't enough, you can take the full buy-in creation option, which grants an additional medium track at the cost of slower magic item slot development. Interestingly, the equipment system is tag-based, 
with weapons having varying tags that change their effects. This has an implicit assumption that there is no set weapon chart of differing damages, but rather something that's made based on three of these tags. Because these tags are largely divorced from weapon damage, it's in the other character choices that a weapon will be more or less effective. This, combined with the more limited pool of magic item slots, demonstrates that this is a game aiming to focus on abilities, not equipment. It's in the use of non-combat skills that things get interesting, starting with social encounters. In addition to the usual defenses of armor class and saving throws, characters have four defenses based on the interaction skills. Bluff, Diplomacy, Intimidate, and Perception. A success in one of these gives you a token, which is described as political capital by the book. But there's a catch. When you declare this roll, your target may make the same roll as well and gain a token. These tokens are spent on making a request or demand, spending up to your current pool, at which point the target may either match your bid or exceed it with a counteroffer. This is further expanded in skill games. While skill games do use tokens, typically the difficulty for the roll is set by the GM and is not limited to interaction skills, though the available skills and skill usage will be set in advance. The next phase is based on the two types of skill games, bidding and option. In the former case, each character chooses an available action and bids a number of tokens in secret, then reveals the token's bid first, with the highest bidder taking their chosen action and everyone else taking their actions in descending order. In the latter case, both sides choose a number of actions based on the cap set by the skill's action set. While the book does provide a few example skill games, I think the guideline for custom skill games could go a long way to showing the potential of this system. Furthermore, I think aspects like multiple rolling rounds being a little more clear could certainly help, especially since action sets have varying effects based on how many tokens you win by. It's something with a huge amount of potential, but it isn't quite realized in this book. While the under the hood aspects of character creation, advancement, feats, and the focus of abilities certainly separate its mechanics from its source material, the game still has a lot of the DNA of D&D 3rd Edition. Putting aside the pool of actions it has, there's another elephant in the room, and that's in its use of the old Vancey and Spell Charge model. It's not as bad as 3rd Edition's take, but I don't feel the spells per day approach really fits the kind of game Legend is aiming to be. Before I wrap it up, I want to give a few notes on the various classes in the core book. We'll start with the Barbarian, which is one of the signature offensive classes for a legend. Focused on taking damage and dishing it out in equal measure. However, it's not married to its alignment or its rage as a one-note ability. Furthermore, its offensive ability can be either Strength or Dexterity, or any other potential ability for multi-class Barbarians. Legend doesn't really have a fighter equivalent class, but the Barbarian makes an excellent foundation. Its three tracks are the Path of War, which focuses on strength-enhancing Rage or speed-enhancing Dervish, the Path of Destruction, which is on wide controlling attacks, and the Path of the Ancestors, which is the Barbarian's defensive track. Monks are the quintessential unarmed combatant. In this case, it's more than just the Kung Fu archetype primarily. Any fighter who fights without weapons fits ideally with the monk's abilities. Its other tracks allow monk's defensive maneuvers to emphasize its avoid style or a strong style through Discipline of the Serpent, which gives its unarmed weapon properties, Discipline of the Crane for its mobility, and Discipline of the Dragon for its resistance based around toughness or evasion, called Careful Sun or Reckless Moon. Continuing on the trend of archetype breaking, the Paladin in Legend is more than just lay on hands and potential falling. In Legend, it's described as a character that draws strength from justice, whatever form that justice may take. While the Paladin does share offensive capabilities with the Barbarian, Paladins have more defensive capabilities and aura powers. Their main track is Judgment, which is all about sensing auras, kind of the equivalent of the text spells in D&D 3rd. The remaining tracks are Dedication and Oath, which are chosen between two of the following. Heroica for partnered combat, Smiting for single targeted combat, Bastion for anti-magic auras, or Virtue for healing auras. In D&D, rangers are assumed to have an animal companion, that's not the case with Legend. Instead, they favor guerrilla warfare and skirmish fighting. Characters who emphasize indirect tactics and using the environment to their advantage have the ideal start with Rangers. Through their tracks of Professional Soldier, which is all about trap and tool use, Daggers and Bolts, which is split between a rain of arrows for ranged combatants and Iron Magi for, com for combination melee attacks, and Battles Tempering for retreat abilities. Rogues in Legend are still skill monkeys to an extent like they were in D&D. 
but it's not as much of a typecast here. They provide the ideal basis for those who want to be jack of many trades and master of few. This is accomplished through their tracks Esoterica Radica, which is about manipulating luck, their offensive track, which can be either Assassin for ambush tactics, Swashbuckler for precision fighting, or Demo Man for explosive crafting. Their defensive track can be either Acrobatic Adept for defensive maneuvers, I Am Ten Ninjas for stealth tactics, or Fortune's Friend for being more silver-tongued. The Sage is our first spellcasting class, although not quite in the traditional sense yet. They occupy the Cleric archetype to a degree. Those who wish to have quasi-magical abilities to use but not utilize the spellbook proper ideally will have Sages as a base. Their tracks are Sage's Wrath, which can be split between either Just Blade as an energy weapon or Arcane Lore to use energy magic, Force of Will, which is mostly defensive magical abilities, and Arcane Secrets, which is spatial and controlling magic. The Shaman is the wisdom-based spellcasting class, and one of the two that actually has a spell list. Fitting in the niches of druids and war mages alike, the Shaman's spell list has some defensive abilities, but the majority of its options are in the direct variety. Characters who opt to utilize dramatic forms of power make, ide make ideal shamans. Their tracks are Incantation, which is their metamagic abilities, the Shaman's Path, which is shorthand for any track outside of Judgment and Esoteric Erratica that don't really work, and spellcasting for their shamanistic spells. Lastly is the Tactician, which is the intelligence-based spellcasting class, akin to Martial and Warlord classes with a small dash of Wizard. It's the yin to the shaman's yang, as the Tactician leans more on support effects over direct combat. Essentially, this is the class that plays the best with others or leads from the front. This is usually done through its Tactical Insight track, as well as Bag of Tricks for group maneuvering and its Tactical Magic track for spellcasting. I would be remiss if I did not also mention that there is an equivalent to Racial Paragon classes within Legends Approach, and that's accomplished through the Racial tracks. They also fill the niche of Half Races and Bloodlines in D&D 3rd Edition. Unlike normal tracks, these things also replace the racial effects and stat development from your base class. I've made it clear that I respect games that follow through on a strong design goal versus those that don't. For the most part, Legend System does this with its more empowered sense of design. It's definitely built for those that like to tweak and add options to builds. In other words, me. That said, it doesn't shake off all of D&D's, um, quirks, for lack of a better term. As I said before, I do think that spell charges don't fit within this game's philosophy and it may have been better off using a simplified action system instead of 3rd edition's set of standard, move, swift, and immediate. Even with those shortcomings, I can confidently give the game a stamp of strongly recommended. This is the definition of a diamond in the rough. Its presentation is a bit messy, and encounters will take some degree of work due to the lack of a monster manual, even with monster creation systems in the book, but the potential present makes up for its shortcomings. The fact that this game is free makes the point all the stronger. While the game has been rendered cold by its developers, the forums still have a decent amount of expansion to sink your teeth into. If you prefer keeping equipment light and not juggling the Monty Hall, this game is for you. Stay frosty!